Live. Welcome to On The Chain. This is Jeff here with you guys today. Looking forward to having this conversation. We're going to dissect a little bit. I want to go back and do a little bit of a recap on the uh, conversation that we had with Jeremy Hogan and John Deaton. Also look at the conversation that John Deaton had with uh, Charlie Gasparino yesterday. Uh, but very important. There's been a couple interesting articles and documents that have come out lately regarding uh, this case, uh, SEC v. Ripple. And one of the big ones is that there is a document or a series of emails out there regarding Hinman's uh, uh, viewpoints on Ethereum. And in fact, it may not be a personal opinion, but he may have actually been speaking on behalf of or in a, at least in a, an official capacity um, on behalf of the SEC. So one of the things that we've talked about here a lot is this semantics of when it's your personal opinion versus when it's your professional opinion. And we want to get into that a little bit today. Now, I realize I'm wearing a black shirt on a dark background. At least I've got a light logo. I, did, I wasn't thinking uh, when I came in today, but that's okay. We're going to have a good conversation anyways. So if you guys are ready, I'm ready to kick this thing off. So I say, let's go. Welcome to On The Chain. Now, welcome back. So as I was sitting here making everything, <laughs> I realized I forgot to make the espresso. Now. In light of not having espresso today, I ran in there. I got some Yorkshire tea. This is the uh, Yorkshire biscuit tea, and I made some of that. And it's almost it's not going to be as good as an espresso, but you know, but still, it's gonna it's gonna make do. Let's see how it is. Oh, see, that's pretty good. It's not bad. Now, if you're going to replace your espresso with tea, then you at least has to have to use a good quality tea, Yorkshire. Uh, uh, Tetley's, um, there's actually one, um, uh, from Boston that's really good. Can't remember the name of it. So, all right, let's, uh, let's see what we've got here. Let's see, where do we want to start? You know, one place that I would love to start, and I think I'm going to need my headphones here. So let's, uh, let's plug those in. Now the, the starting point here is there was a, uh, a video from uh, the crypto law, uh, and this was on September 7th. Now, the significance of this video that we're going to review briefly uh, is that it talks about settlement. So it talks about a reality check on settlement. Um, so let's see if we can uh, cue this up here. It's a little bit long, uh, but I think we could uh, we can get into it and we can do a Oops, you know, I forgot to share the audio. Let me go back. Share. There we go. All right, here we go. There you go. Nottinghamshire. Nottingham. It's funny. I know we butcher the names over here, you know, and it's, uh, if you were to say uh, Nottingham, I know it's at the end. Over here, we're going to say Shire only because that's how it's written, but I know that that's not how it's pronounced at all. So, all right, let's pull this up here. Here we go. So crypto law, U.S. legal and regulatory news for digital asset holders. This video is on a reality check on settlement. Let's see if we can listen for just a few minutes um, and then we're going to move on because I think that this is kind of an important uh, video. Hopefully we can get enough out of it in the first minute or so. Welcome back to Crypto Law TV. I'm John Deaton, your host and the founder. Today's topic is probably the most talked about and discussed and tweeted about topic of all topics related to the SCCV Ripple case. And what is that? Settlement. And is a settlement in the works? What is the likelihood of a settlement? And all of those issues that are burning as we're getting ready for what potentially could be uh, the last biggest bull run of uh, crypto's next cycle. Recently, BitBoy, who has one of the largest, if not the largest following in all of crypto land, as he says, uh, 
made a bold prediction. And that prediction was that settlement discussions are in the works. And in fact, it's a done deal and that it will be settled by the end of September. And a lot of people have challenged that because I have filed a motion to intervene and I'm a litigant in the case, a lot of people have asked me, what do I think about that? And there's been a lot of confusion because a lot of people don't believe that a settlement is in the works based on the litigation that's taking place. For example, there was a hearing motion to compel uh, the documents related to Bitcoin, Ethereum and XRP and the SEC's um, invoking the deliberative process privilege. There was a hot contested hearing, and we know that there's a motion to compel that's been filed by the SEC for. Now, you know, this is this is really interesting because, you know, one of the things that, you know, we go back to, and I don't mean, you know, throw that in right away, and we'll just start playing John Deaton, you know. Um, so, <laughs> Jim D. That's funny. I pulled that up. John Deaton and Jeff seem to buy from the same uh, shirt company. We need an official XRP Army uniform. I think you're right. You know, that's one of the things that we should uh, we should work on. You know, as a uh, you know, as an official XRP Army uniform, that'd be good. So you know, so what's key, what's key here is that number one, um, you had somebody in the community, Bitboy, comes out and makes this statement. Um, with in front of all of his followers saying that a settlement is almost guaranteed now almost guaranteed by the end of September obviously today is October 9th so it never happened right there was no settlement and in fact we're seeing the case progressing um, and there's a lot of animosity on both sides now one of the things that we got out of the conversation on Thursday uh, with Jeremy Ogan and John Deaton is that Neither side are going to reveal uh, their, uh, you know, they're going to reveal uh, all of their cards right up front. So they're not going to say, hey, we're willing to settle. Each side is going to stay as far apart as possible. And then hopefully there's some meeting uh, in the middle. Now, the one thing, though, that I, I believe is different, forget about the legal aspect of everything, because that's better left to, you know, John and Jeremy and, and others. But just from a perspective of, you know, the way I'm looking at, you know, this settlement and, and this is coming from statements from Brad Garlinghouse or Stuart Alderati or others uh, in that on that side is that they're there now fighting on behalf of the crypto space at large. It's not just they're fighting on behalf of XRP because we know exactly that if this case somehow settles without any type of clarity which again is something they want to make sure that at the end of the case, they want to, it has to be very, very clear that XRP is not a security. Now, anything outside of that, it's got to go the whole way. That means that, you know, Ripple cannot settle on a fact that XRP is a security because if they do, then that is then going to be used by Daddy G to then go after every other crypto company in existence. Uh, with that same fact. And so that's outside of the law, you know, so forget about the legal aspect. But now, you know, we have to look at this from a perspective that this is all about how do we get to the next stage of normalcy? How do we get to regulatory clarity? And it's not going to be settled by the SEC. It can't be settled uh, at this level of the court, this court, there can be an outcome. And as we learned from uh, Jeremy and John the other day, in order for there to be, let's say, a test of sorts, um, you know, so there could be an outcome of clarity. But in terms of a test, let's say we want to look for a ripple test, it needs to elevate all the way to the Supreme Court. Now, outside of that happening, another path to regulatory clarity has to come through. And this is in the US because we've seen countries all around the world. And we have people on with us right now from the UK, from Sweden, from the Philippines, from Thailand, from all over the world. In certain, in some of these countries, they already have a path towards normalcy. They already have a path towards regulatory clarity. Now, for some reason in the US, we're tripping over ourselves. It's as though 
our representatives are running around with their shoes tied together and they can't figure it out. They can't figure out why they keep tripping. And it's mainly because their shoes are tied together. And if they would only look down from time to time and figure it out, maybe they would uh, be in a little bit better of a spot, but that's not the case. Now we know that to achieve proper, true regulatory clarity, it's not to the SEC. It is 100% due, uh, as a direct outcome of legislation. Now, some of the things that we're going to talk about today, and that's really critical for us to talk about today, is number one, uh, there is now some documents that need to be shown to the court that may have shown that, in fact, Hinman, while he was at the SEC, was operating under his official capacity in making statements that Ethereum was actually not a security. Now, the way the SEC backtracked that was creating this division of thought where you can operate under your personal capacity and you can then operate under your professional capacity, even though an individual that is employed by this said government agency is out speaking in front of people and brought in to speak to them due to his position with said agency. So had it not been for his position and title with said agency, then this group may never have brought him to be a guest speaker. And so when those two things are tied together, then obviously, you know, you have to have a thought process that, hey, maybe you were invited as a representative of said agency and everything you say from this point forward in front of people, unless you specifically state, hey, this is not uh, the, this is not a statement of or an official statement or an approved statement of said agency, but this is my personal opinion. If you do not say that, then those that are watching will automatically be under an assumption that everything that you say is based on professional opinion. So, and I think that's where there's a little bit of a conflict uh, from different statements that we've seen, and they always have tried to backtrack on these statements, and it's a little bit uh, disingenuous. And so this is something that we really need to, you know, identify and dissect. And in fact, that's exactly what's happening. That's exactly what's coming out of this, out of this. And so, you know, so for the next, you know, few uh, tweets here, and I do want to go into, and we'll do that in a little bit. Uh, there was a, kind of a, uh, a week in review, uh, uh, with, you know, on, on, uh, on a, on a, a live stream with uh, Charlie Gasparino and uh, and John Deaton, and uh, and we're going to look at that here in a minute as well because I thought it was uh, you know pretty uh, spot on. Uh, and so let me let me try to find the right uh, the right documents here. Here's one. Okay, let me pull this over here, uh, and then I know you can't see it yet. Uh, I'm going to pull. Let's see. Uh, Okay, here's this one. This is from Financial Finance Feeds. Um, let me pull over. Uh, here's this one too. Negligence. Okay, now, all right. Let's, so let's go one by one. Let's see what we've got here. Okay, so let me share the screen. Let me add it. There we go. So this one's from James Filan. Um, and this, so this is breaking, breaking news. This was yesterday. Uh, eight o'clock in the morning, he posted this breaking one of three posts that he has. We'll read through them um, and really come up with. And then we're going to get into the uh, finance feeds. Uh, and this is looking at like a major win in the space. Now, it keeps going back and forth. But Judge Nepburn has really been, you know, pressing, I would say, relatively aggressively on the SEC because overall, the SEC doesn't seem to be extremely responsive to the request of the judge, you know, so, you know, that, that's definitely, uh, you know, definitely some issues here. So, Hey, for all of you guys that are brand new here, um, and you may be brand new, um, and you haven't done so already, um, I'd highly recommend that you hit 
the uh, subscribe button, hit that uh, bell notification. That way you get notified when we go live. Obviously hit the thumbs up if you're here watching, you like what you see. If you don't, hey, hit the thumbs down. Uh, we're okay with that too. But make sure you hit subscribe. That's the most important part. Whether you hit thumbs up, thumbs down, hit subscribe and the bell. Um, and we do stream live six days a week. So Saturday morning is one of them at 8 a.m. Eastern Standard Time every Saturday. So, all right, uh, breaking. Uh, so Judge Neffern orders the SEC to submit for in-camera review the two documents related to the SEC's meetings with law firms and the email chain concerning discussions with a third party who received guidance from the SEC. Uh oh. <laughs> so, so this is this is really kind of mud on the face of the SEC once again. Now, how are they going to tap dance around this? How are they going to tap dance uh, and and keep making up? you know, certain statements uh, to to the opposite, which they seem to be doing pretty well because we know that when Daddy G gets up in front of uh, the camera and in front of people, he just starts saying, hey, look at look at the shiny uh, object. Look at these oranges and look at this and look, uh, they're making money. They're making money on and uh, and the Howie test. And so, uh, all right. So number two. Uh, to analyze its digital asset under the framework set forth in Hinman's June 14th, 2018 speech. So we're talking about three years ago, uh, the SEC must also submit an explanation for its privilege assertions for all those documents no later than October 15th. So that date is fast approaching. Uh, let's see what happens. Number three, the SEC must also file a redacted version of its submission on the public docket. Defendant's response due no later than October 22nd. Now, I love you know seeing some of the commentary uh, from people. Anders, the SEC is effed here, and then XRP Gator, absolutely. Uh, you know, so there, there's just a lot, a lot going on here, and. You know, so we get into it. We're gonna we're gonna watch this video uh, briefly of what came up. But let me uh, let me see if we can pull up. So Patty XRP, weren't they supposed to already have uh, done all the in camera reviews by now? Our legal system is so ridiculous. Rob says, honestly, the older I get, more and more I'm sta starting to believe. Protect the border, deliver the mail are the only legitimate government functions. Is the good judges famous uh, patients? Uh, fair to us, uh, long-suffering retail investors, right? Uh, they know the score. <laughs> I, I love how people, uh, you know, their responses to this stuff. But th but this is really key. You know, this is really important um, in terms of what uh, what um, James was sharing with us here. You know, because if we pull up this document, so this is was September twenty fourth. Uh, this document was uh, submitted here, um, and so. Let's see what we've got. We write on behalf of the defendants, Bradley Garland House and uh, Chris Lars uh, Larson and Ripple, connection with the courts, in-camera review of documents identified on Appendix A to defendant's motion filed on August 10th. Uh, the document identified in Appendix A represents a sample of entries from the SEC's privilege logs submitted as of the date of filing uh, based on the descriptions provided by the SEC appeared to be most relevant to the claims and defense in the case. So, you know, let's see, uh, two days after the hearing, blah, blah, blah. Uh, the description of three of these documents from the belatedly produced privilege logs suggests they may be highly relevant. Uh, to relate to meetings the SEC had with law firms to discuss the unprecedented confusion in the market regarding the SEC's view on status of digital assets under federal securities law. The third is an email chain, and this is the one that's really uh, key. I can't highlight it. Uh, the third is an email chain concerning discussions with a third party whom defendants understand received guidance from the SEC to analyze its digital asset under the framework set forth in Director Hinman's June 14th, 2018 speech. So this is really, really a, a key point that they're bringing up because up until now, one of the things that we've seen is that the SEC has been very kind of, uh, you know, like I was saying, standoffish, but they've been dancing around the fact that that was based on personal opinion, that conversation, and wasn't done in, in, in his official uh, 
uh, in his official uh, positioning. And so you look at this. And so now the court has says, uh, so ordered, right? So Sarah Nepburn stamps it, right? So let's, let's pull this up real quick. This is a really important piece of document. So uh, if you look at this, uh, defendant's request is granted. The SEC shall submit the two documents related to the SEC's meetings with law firms and the email chain for in-camera review, along with a submission, a submission explaining its privilege assertions for each of those documents no later than October 15th. So next week, right? Then defendants' uh, response is due no later than the 22nd. So now the onus has now been put back onto the SEC and how are they now going to tap dance around this without Gensler getting up there and kind of doing the, hey, this is, you know, shiny object. Here's a shiny object I want you to look at. This is, you know, key information that we have to look at. And and it's and it's it's critical. So look at here we have uh what does that say? Uh gunner bites um as a financial professional I believe you have uh, to exercise high standard of care if you are invited to talk as an expert to a large audience. Personal opinion just does not fit here. Now, I agree 100% with that because, uh, and, and I've come out and said that uh, to others. There, In the past, there's been some people that come out into the Twitter space and they start speaking as uh, as a professional. And as a professional, you immediately gain a certain uh, decorum of respect due to the professional status that that person holds. That means that their opinion on a subject matter may be elevated in status based on their professional experience. And so to uh, Gunnabite's, you know, uh, specific point, and that relates to Hinman or anybody else from a, a government position to go in and then speak in front of an audience and then try to then spin it into being a, a personal opinion versus their uh, professional uh, opinion. And then being a professional opinion representing the organization that they work for. So I think there's a lot of, you know, uh, you know, confusion that is that is brought up about that, which is exactly why it's so important to have this evidence now brought in in front of the judge to be discussed. I think it's it's so critical. You know, it's 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 really, really uh, solid here. Now, Chip is bringing up OTC is eight subscribers away from 20,000, 20,000 subscribers. We will hit 20,000 subscribers on today's show. So if you're with us today and you haven't hit the subscribe button, hit that subscribe button because you will push us over the 20,000 number. Now, Chip says that we already had six that did it. So we were two subs away just a couple of minutes ago. We can do it. You can do it. We can push this over to 20,000. So that'd be awesome. Um, Ted's life is saying, I think after Ripple wins, the SEC will sue ETH, ETH uh, or Ethereum. Which is why it then becomes so critical for there to be clarity of outcome. So we don't want a, you know, just a, some random settlement. And I believe, you know, even when we were talking to Jeremy and, and John uh, on Thursday, the idea of a settlement could be part, there could be partial settlement. They could separate out uh, the case against uh, Brad and Chris and then focus only on, hey, you know what, as, as as Ripple, they sold an unregistered security back in 2013, eight years ago, although the SEC has had meetings with Ripple, especially when they were uh, buying or investing in a large percentage of MoneyGram and transferring XRP to MoneyGram uh, for that purchase. Now, all of that had to have been approved by the SEC. Now they approved it, and then they try to retract statements. So it's it's really crazy. But to Ted's point, yes, if depending on the outcome of this case, we know that there are going to be lawsuit crazy because we've already seen evidence of Gary Gensler go, wanting to go about everybody, uh, you know, go after everybody. So Ani saying, congratulations, guys. Appreciate it. Yeah, thank you very much. XRP helps the world. Uh, ETH fee is criminal. And 
XRP minimalist. I, you know, I tend to agree with the the amount of gas fees is outrageous. It's really it's outlandish. And in fact, I've got money and some asset. I've got USDC and some other tokens that are over. And I, I use the uh, MetaMask wallet. I can't move it because every time I try to move it, the gas fees are astronomical. And so there it sits, and it's not going anywhere. So. You know, so that so that's it. Um, let's see here. What do we got? What do we got? Some other comments. Chip said we did pass the twenty thousand mark, which is awesome. And then I have uh, Devon Steve over here was responding to gun bites, saying true. Uh, we we've, we've all been saying that it's such a cop out to say that phrase. Uh, it's uh, permeated to nearly every time they speak now. Total scandal, and that's exactly what it is. You can't hide, and these are non-elected officials. These are appointed officials. Uh, Gary Gensler is not elected. He was appointed uh, by an administration that we know has been singling out uh, the crypto space aggressively uh, and trying to label it almost as a criminal, uh, uh, as a, as a criminal entity. So every time Janet Yellen or Elizabeth Warren or one of those others comes out and speaks, they always reference the nefarious purposes that uh, digital assets are used for versus trying to focus on the benefit of uh, the space at large for retail investors and the growth of the technology. Whereas we have seen, as Gary Gensler was brought uh, in front of uh, Congress again last week, and we saw uh, 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 Tom Emmer and uh, Warren Davidson and uh, McHenry all questioning uh, and bringing to light some of the inaccuracies that have been promoted by Mr. Daddy G. And last week, we also had uh, Dan, uh, Decentralized Dan. Now, we know we're all Dan. So we had uh, Decentralized Dan on, and Decentralized Dan was also, he called Gary to the mat. Uh, when when he was at that conference and we showed that video, we had Dan on last week and he brought Gary to the mat based on his inaccuracies of trying to label that every single crypto project was trying to be a currency. And the fact that uh, the things and statements that come out of the SEC and out of the mouth of Gary Gensler aren't always accurate um, as as it relates to the crypto space. And we actually see a very aggressive uh, mentality um, and initiative that's coming from uh, the administration. So that, and again, you know, some of the key players would be Gary Gensler right now. He's kind of the front guy. Then we've got Elizabeth Warren, who has been uh, very adamant in the, and we can see that she has a very clear lack of understanding of this space. But yet she wants to promote her ideas as same as uh, Janet Yellen, the Treasury Secretary. So you put those together and you say, hey, what in the world is going on here? So let's uh, let's see here. Devon is saying funny, but if you get work done off the books, it's always in cash, not card or crypto. Strange, isn't it? It's very strange. Hey, let's let's do this off the record. OK, how are you going to do that? Well, here's fiat, right? So, or, or a, a trade of sorts. So it's not going to be crypto. It, it's not going to happen. And they keep trying to level, uh, bring it back that way. Uh, Alpha, Alpha May, uh, let's see, we got SEC versus Ripple, similar to Dr. Brzezinski, FDA, 1995, same time stealing uh, uh, Burz's patents, uh, SEC, same tactic, but threatening those behind the scenes via government agencies, longer stall, more they take in the background. So very relevant. I'm not familiar with the, that from 1995, the FDA case, but interesting because you do see a lot of that. And we've seen interesting enough if we were to have a show here talking about science and uh, viruses, you could have a long conversation about what's going on at the FDA and the, and the CDC uh, level as it relates to pharmaceutical industries um long long history right so that's you're probably bringing up i don't know what case that is that you're referencing about the fda so you know and and a patent st uh, theft but there's a lot you know a lot of uh lot of issues um so let's see here uh okay uh where were we oh so 
So here's so now you know so we just we just basically referenced what uh, James Vilan was was showing based on those court documents that have to be shown. Now uh, it kind of goes back, and so we now we have you know conversation right in in print uh, in some of these uh, blogs and articles that are going to come out. Ripple scores major win as judge finds out if SEC lied to the court. Now did they lie to the court? Did they hide uh, this whole conversation with? Director William Hinman uh, from that 2018 speech. And this is it right here. This one little statement that's brought out in the article. Again, at the center of the debate is ex SEC Director William Hinman, who gave a famous speech in 2018 stating Ethereum is not a security, which prompted the price of ETH to skyrocket. Now, one of the other things that we can also see, and this is where uh, when uh, Gary Genzer was brought in front of Congress is some of the questioning, the line of questioning that they had for uh, Gary Gensler also then focused on what about the retail investors? What happens to the retail investors when, in fact, you file this suit and you go after a company? And then he had a little dance. He tap danced around it and went off to something about how the Howie test and oranges and who knows what he was talking about. But here's another one. Uh, this is also on finance feeds. Um, also important because uh, Ripple calls negligence um, as the SEC seeks $1.3 billion from the... Now, if the SEC is going to request $1.3 billion in, in revenue generated by Ripple, what in the world is going on? Like, who gets that money? Now, the one thing that we have to clearly, clearly understand in all of this, and this is where we're seeing this zealous approach from Gary Gensler and others in this administration, is that we've had certain statements coming out from this administration that there is a, a number of bills that have been put on the table that within the next 12 months would equal, equal to nine trillion dollars in expenditures. So you've got a $1.5 trillion infrastructure bill where they tried to wrap cryptocurrency into some back page of this uh, legislation that they're trying to cram through. Um, and then at the same time, they're voting on another $3.5 trillion uh, 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 three point three uh, expenditure, and so you wrap those together five trillion. But overall, if you expand it out, they're looking at like nine trillion dollars in in expenditures over the next twelve months. Now, one of the things they said is, "Don't worry about it because it's paid for." How is it paid for? Increase in taxation, a mechanism to somehow take and go after uh, fintech, go after crypto companies, find out where the wealth is. If you follow the money and you follow how they want the money and what they're potentially going to do with the money, this is very clear that the SEC now is going and targeting 1.3 billion. Now, a billion in, in these trillions is relatively insignificant, but they keep pressing this idea that there's going to be zero uh, uh, debt accrued into $9 trillion in debt. So it's just like, it makes no sense. But the one tactic that they are using is that they want to come after organizations like Ripple. They want to come after retail holders of digital assets. Why? Because retail holders of digital assets in the US and all around the world from back in uh, 2010 forward, there have been multiple multiple, multiple billionaires that have been created or millionaires that have been created. People have been making money, whether you're making 10,000, a hundred thousand, a million, a thousand, whatever that number is, people have been making money. Retail investors have been making money in the digital asset space. Some haven't, some have lost just like in the stock market. You win, you lose. Now, if you're trying to trade, if you're trying to you know, play options or whatever you're going to do uh, with the digital asset space, then you're risking in a speculative investment and you're increasing the risk. But, you know, the long term holders, the early adopters, and we haven't even seen the beginning of it because we're still in the early phase. We're in the first 10 years. 
go out another 10 years. These guys understand. These guys truly understand and comprehend that the true battle that's being waged right now is the removal of the power, the repositioning of the uh, economic powerhouses from those uh, that were adhering to the brick and mortars of the banking and the financial institutions, the old brick and mortars, the old lobby group that pulls the strings like marionettes of the majority of uh, Congress in the U.S., they pull the strings. Now that those strings are being cut and being replaced by the crypto boom. So the crypto boom, the expansion of the fintechs, you have money that is being printed at levels they've never seen before. And it's giving people in the retail space, no matter what country you're in, it gives everybody an opportunity to better their life. Now, the one thing that these brick and mortars they want to do, they want to maintain the control and the semblance of, of, uh, of access to money. They want to make you continue to believe that you have control over your outcome, uh, your money outcome. Now, while they're doing that, these big institutions are making hefty percentages off of every dollar that is borrowed from them, every dollar they inject into the system. That is how they are managing control. Now they see, and they're paying out peanuts on interest. They're paying you 0.5, 0.2%. And they, they make it sound like, oh, we're doing you a favor and we're paying you a half a percent interest annually. You should be happy that you're making nothing. Then come along and all of a sudden you have organizations like Celsius or what Coinbase was trying to do, pay out 4%. Hey, 4% is amazing to a retail investor, especially in a period of time where we are seeing drastic inflation impacting the entire world especially in the United States, we're seeing drastic inflation. And then we have an administration that keeps laughing at it, laughing about it, and making believe that every all these uh, people that have studied economics, uh, that are involved in economics are stupid. They don't know what they're talking about because there's no, there's no inflation. No such thing as inflation. Not happening. Not impacting the regular people on the streets when gas prices have gone up by three times and the cost of goods have doubled. The cost of food is going up uh, drastically week after week after week. Uh, the the, the, the uh, cost of rent is inflating. The cost of insurance is inflating. So you tell me that the average person on the street that they keep saying they're trying to protect is actually doing better today than they were two years ago and you're out of your mind because that's not the case. The cost of everything is getting higher and higher and higher. And the one thing that they see is that in this crypto space, they're seeing people in the crypto space making money. And they're seeing that their projected future growth of value in crypto is going to continue to expand. The cat's out of the bag. The train has left the train station. There's nothing they can do about it. There's nothing they can do about it. Um, but yet they're going to continue to try pushing back. And that's exactly what we're seeing from Daddy G. He's going to continue. Uh, there's another article that came out from, uh, you know, talking about how he's going to go after, he's going after the Wall Street's bets guys because they're obviously evil and they're bad and and we can't allow that to happen. And you have to go after and look at, you know, all these different assets where people are finally, you know, finding the mechanism to start generating and making money. And then they want to pull it back. Why do they want to pull it back? Because many of these investment vehicles are reserved for accredited investors. In order to be an accredited investor, you have to hold assets of $1 million or more. That's the starting point. If you have a million dollars or more, then in that case, you can be an accredited investor. Until that point, you're not going to be an accredited investor. And guess what? If you don't meet the criteria, you don't get to take advantage of those investment vehicles, which is exactly what the type of spin and nonsense that they're trying to create. Because right now, the one thing that we have seen in the DeFi space and decentralization equals freedom. We have to remember that. It doesn't matter what country we're in. And we're seeing pushback and resistance all over the world from country to country to country that's saying, you know what? I want to protect my interest. I want to protect my friends. I want to protect my family. I want to protect myself. It's up to me to make sure that I am furthering our benefit. You know, and and it's and that's it. You know, it's it's unbelievable. It, it really is. And so 
So we look at this and Ripple's calling negligence. What in the world is the SEC doing uh, that $1.3 billion from the XRP lawsuit? What about the other way around? What about the billions of dollars that XRP investors have lost due to the fact that the SEC filed this lawsuit to begin with? You know, it's it's unreal. It's just, it's unbelievable. So here we go. You're right. I need to, I need to go back down. Let me go back down to like a, a level. Let's go back to a level two, level two. Okay. Level two. Here we go. <laughs> we can get fired up. Uh, hang on. Yep. Doesn't help. But um, all right. So let's see what we got here. Um, oh, so this, this is a good one too. Let's pull this one up. Oh, uh, let's just do this because this is interesting. This will bring us down a level and then we can go to the other. <laughs> then we can bring it back up again. We can get heated again. How about that? So one of the things that happened over the past day while everybody was sleeping and not paying attention, the world bodies got together and they decided that they finally passed a minimum corporate tax. How awesome is that? A minimum corporate tax. All the countries in the world, 15%, 15%. Now tell me that these countries are not getting together and colluding in order to take from these corporations. Now, I'm not saying that, uh, you know, the corporation should be, you know, running around scot-free, but at the same time, in a free market, let the companies go where they might. But now the world bodies got together and they said, well, wait a minute. Ireland normally collects about 10% corporate tax, but the world, we want everyone to do a minimum of 15. So all these other countries that have been attracting corporations to their shores based on, uh, based on low uh, corporate tax rates have now been screwed over. However, during that period of time, which was yesterday, uh, we've got Binance is looking to Ireland for their centralized headquarters, mainly because if they go there, they also have a low corporate tax rate for the time being. So Ireland could be a great place uh, for Binance. Now, one of the issues that many have had with Binance is they've never had a headquarters. I, I still don't understand how you can operate as a an exchange. I, I understand we're in the decentralized market, but as an exchange with managing serious amounts of money, you need to have a corporate office. You might not have your CEO in the corporate office, but you need to have a corporate office. You need to have a phone room. You need to have an address, et cetera. But under pressure from regulators around the world, major exchange finance is looking to establish headquarters in Ireland. Until now, it has operated globally for years under what uh, Chang Peng Zhao has described as decentralized structure. Hey, that's awesome. You still need an address. I, I, even in the DeFi space, you still need an address. Even in the work from home space, you need an address. And it's about time that they uh, they go and 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 uh, get their address situated. Uh, Binance has moved around the world. They've gone to Malta. They've been all over the place when they left China because there was a major track uh, crackdown in China. They've bounced around. They didn't know where they were going to go. Uh, but Ireland actually could be a really uh, great place for them uh, to go. Uh, it's interesting. You know, so uh, let's see, February 20. So you can see, I mean, over the years, they've never really found their, their home. And now it is about time that they actually, uh, uh, they actually find a home. <laughs> so I think, I think that's critical. I think that's something that has to happen. And John Dean does have a YouTube channel. Um, that was the one that I was on and now I closed it. I would have to go back and find it again. Um, but we can put up, uh, Deaton's, um, let's see, I can get rid of these tabs. Let me get rid of that one. <clears throat> All right. Let's pull up another one here. Let's see. Okay. So this, and, and I want to reference this one, you know, I, I, I'm glad that, uh, Tony brought this to, um, uh, to light. Uh, this from Thinking Crypto. Let me pull this up. Hang on. There we go. 
So the so Tony from Thinking Crypto brought this over, and he said breaking uh, Biden administration weighing executive order on crypto. Fingers crossed, this is something good. Now I I get his passion here. I get what you know he he was hoping for. You know, and, and so uh, the article that he posted here, breaking news: White House weighs wide ranging push for crypto oversight. Now. In this little bit of uh, from the Bloomberg terminal, it is. I, I don't understand how people can get away with this kind of reporting, uh, but uh, let's see what we've got here. The, and this is just brief, and I've got the other article up as well, the longer one. But the Biden administration is weighing an executive order on cryptocurrency as part of an effort to set up a government wide approach to the white hot asset class, according to people familiar with the matter. Now, what kind of reporter? <laughs> and this is this is up to the people because now we've allowed this to happen, right? People familiar with the matter, just people, just random people that might be familiar. I don't. I I, I find this to be a, a little problematic when a news source like Bloomberg uses people familiar with the matter. I, I want to know who said it, not. People familiar with the matter. matter. Uh, the proposed directive would charge federal agencies to study and offer recommendations on relevant areas of crypto, touching on financial regulation, economic innovation, and national security, said the people who has not to be named discussing plans that are still under consideration. How about keep your mouth closed, don't say anything, and if you do say something, then in that situation, you get to have your name put into the media uh, press. How about that? So <laughs> uh, it, it's just so crazy, you know, but anyhow, so we brought this out and, and I'm looking at this. And I'm thinking nothing good can come from an executive order. <laughs> nothing good can come from an administration that is that has Gary Gensler, Elizabeth Warren, and Janet Yellen all attacking the legitimacy of cryptocurrency. They say one thing, they do another. Um, but in this, they've been very, very direct on constantly repeating the same inaccurate theme uh, about cryptocurrency being used for nefarious purposes. It's used uh, to circumvent blah, blah, blah. And they're going to keep saying that and saying it. And famously, we saw Elizabeth Warren get out there and start telling the story about someone who had their last hundred dollars and they invested it into crypto. And the next morning they woke up and they saw that the cryptocurrency market had turned and had gone down and they tried to log into Coinbase and they couldn't log in to sell and to recover their losses because there was an issue trying to log into the exchange and their last hundred dollars was stuck. And I, I started listening to the, the words that are coming out of these people's mouths. And I say, do they actually believe the garbage that they're uttering or, you know, are they just reading it? Because as they're, you know, just, uh, you know, just saying and spewing these words, it's just so meaningless, you know, because first and foremost, why in the world is she talking about day trading? You know, so are we day trading now with the money? Uh, are, 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 is she recommending that someone with their last hundred dollars invest in day trading and then wants to buy and sell and take it out at the last uh, minute? Um, you know, which is, which is just bad now. Uh, and then, uh, so Kelly Slate is bringing up that one of the things that was also referenced were ETH fees. Now, Maybe, maybe not. I, you know, I'd have to go back and see what she was saying about that. But that's one asset. And there's a purpose and a reason for the mining and gas fees of Ethereum. It is what it is. That's the project. If you want to trade and buy and sell in that asset, the gas fees are outrageous. But that's the technology. We understand that. We understand that, you know, what, what it is. Uh, just like with Bitcoin, we know that Bitcoin is slow. Um, it is also costly to transact in, that it is not going to be a currency, but as a stated store of value, Bitcoin has achieved the stated store of value. Just as Ethereum has really established itself as a smart contract platform and a platform that others can build their ERC-20 tokens on, gas fees, they'll figure out the technology of the gas fees because at some point people are going to say, hey, you know what? We're not paying those ridiculous gas fees. They don't make any sense to us. Um, but then you have others that are building and 
fine tuning like the polygon is making it making a, a a solution that you can utilize the ethereum network and they're going to make it better you know so there there's others that are going to use so there's a, a purpose for the technology now you have others that might do it a lot better obviously we know we have the xrp ledger and we have xrp the xrp ledger is is one of the most advanced technologies in the space to date it is chock full of all sorts of features that aren't really being identified or utilized and we talked about that with Matt Hamilton uh head of Ripple X uh last week and it's amazing the technology you have the FX exchange you have an exchange built in baked into uh the XRP ledger already it's there it exists you just need to build on top of it now you have uh groups like Flare that want to use uh the XRP ledger and start building their solution for smart contracts and staking. And then David Schwartz was referencing side chains. And so you have the side chains that will allow for private uh, you know, chains on the XRP ledger that can interact with the public chain. I mean, it's it's so amazing the things that are going to happen. We have to remember that we're so early, we're so early to the space that it's still being built, built out and developing. Yet, you know, you have entities within governments that want to clamp down on it and then you have to question why do they have these opinions why are they so passionate are they trying to protect retail investors or are they trying to protect the lobbyists that pay their bills that's the question that we have to identify and if they'd be honest honest brokers which we know they're not but if they would be honest brokers then we might, uh, you know, be able to understand their positioning a little bit differently. Um, Tony Moore said, is saying, I agree, Jeff, our friends from Congress would not have a chance to weigh in if the executive order got through. An executive order is a disaster yeah, for multiple reasons. One, because it's coming strictly from one mindset. There's no discussion, no negotiation, no nothing. And you have an executive order written on something that is so critical to the space. This would be like an executive order written about uh, about the internet in the 90s uh, to regulate the internet by executive order and essentially uh, doing so as a dictator to clamp down on the growth of the internet on behalf of the brick and mortar stores or others. Where would we be today if that was the case? Number two, the bad downside of an executive order is that a new administration comes in, they delete your executive order. It, it has no bearing in legality. And in fact, many of the executive orders are illegal and unconstitutional, and it takes multiple lawsuits in order to, uh, in order to identify the fact that they're not constitutional. You know, so for those outside of the U.S., you look and say, what does that even mean? You know, how is it that a president can write legislation and put it out there like it's law? Um, and then all of a sudden you have the conflict and the tension because it's temporary law. Now, one of the things that they're talking about here, which we've seen bills in front of Congress, bills have been presented in front of Congress that basically do the exact same thing. One of the bills that passed through Congress that went to Senate, we'd have to look and see if it passed, was basically to get the SEC and the CFTC together to discuss the direction of cryptocurrency. All of these things that they're proposing right here, right? They want a federal agency to study and offer recommendations. How stupid is this, right? This is coming from a White House that it just it just has no semblance in reality because why because the token taxonomy act which has now sat in the financial services committee for three sessions of congress being presented three times the token taxonomy act if you go back and read it is the foundation that all discussions should start from and it has sat in the financial services committee at the behest of Maxine Waters for like four years, five years, six years, whatever the amount of time it is now. I mean, it's it's ludicrous. It's not quite that long, but maybe four years, um, and, and three or three, four, whatever. Uh, you guys get the idea. Now, 
If you read the Token Taxonomy Act that was presented by Congressman Warren Davidson and Congressman Darren Soto, a true bipartisan bill. Darren Soto is a Democrat. Warren Davidson's a Republican. They had a meeting of the minds. They came together. They drafted this amazing bill that was presented in front of Congress, <clears throat> presented three times, and just sits there. Gets no recognition in the Financial Services Committee. Why? Because the person at the top has no desire to have discussion. Now, if you want to have true discourse and discussion about crypto, then bring in all the relevant entities and vote on the most important legislation of our times that's already been presented to Congress. This fictitious narrative that we need to have some directive from the White House to charge federal agencies to study it is complete bullshit. Complete bullshit. And all it is, is just making people feel like they're doing something beneficial to a space that they know is growing at a rapid pace all around the world. And it's this is just complete bullshit conversation that they post here. And unfortunately, you have many within this Bloomberg news agency that will continue to promote the bullshit. Yeah, I mean, it's 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 really unreal, right? It's just, it's completely unbelievable. So how do we get back up to five? We need to scale back down to like two. Devon says, uh, coming from the White House that struggles to read a teleprompter yet wants to make a decision on new asset class, go figure. Now, obviously we know that if it, if it is coming from the White House, then it's from a group of people, you know, that will put this together. But it just it's just uh, crazy. You know, it's just crazy. Exactly. So, man, oh, man. Let's see. Um, executive order was put in place before uh, Trump got in. Um, I don't know which one you're referencing. So maybe it's another one that we're uh, that you're referencing there. Um, Jim D.C. and Maxim Water, the perfect WMD of idiocy to blow up free society with the STD of idiocy. I mean, it's just, it's, it's really unbelievable. <clears throat> you know, it's really, it's unreal. So, um, Adri Nagoyan says, XRP, boom, two beautiful countries go into turmoil uh, due to the uh, shitty government. I'm only 18 and I see the flaws. It's plain stupid. Thank God, you know, I'm looking at, this next generation that is growing up. And I say it's the next generation that have to realize the idiocy that's going on at these government levels. And you have to understand it. If you allow it to happen to you, everything that has happened over the course of the past year will continue to happen to you. We need more people that understand what is happening in order for it not to happen again. And that's it. You know, and, and that's and that's and there's so much more to it. We can get there's a whole other political conversation that we can get into it has nothing to do with this, but is relevant to this conversation. But we're not going to do that here because we're focused on cryptocurrency and the, the politics that impact cryptocurrency. <clears throat> so um, I want to bring something else up. Let me see if I can find it. Um, hang on. Where'd it go? I lost it here. Oh, there it is. So uh, Jungle Inc. has been uh, posting this around. You guys know Jungle from his YouTube channel, uh, Jungle Inc. He's one of the OGs in the YouTube space. And uh, but anyhow, so he's got that. There's a petition that's circulating that that he was uh, tweeting about uh, earlier. Almost 1000 signatures to stop Gary Gensler rogue intimidation tactic. Here's a petition. Stop the SEC and Gary Gensler's attack on innovation. Uh, as of the time he posted it, it looks like there are 866 have signed. They want to get to a thousand. This was on uh, Thursday. Not sure what the uh, where the petition is going to go, what they're going to use it for, how impactful or effective it can be. Uh, but I would love to see um, exactly what happens. And then as soon as you start talking about the uh, geopolitical narrative of digital assets, that's exactly when uh, DNI, digital nomad investor pops in because he is the king of the geopolitical space. So <laughs> uh, Tony, appreciate it. Hey, for all of you guys that are in here oh, before that, 
Devon, trouble with the next generation generally is they're more concerned about the great digital games to play rather than digital money, in my opinion. I think that is shifting. That narrative is changing um, a little bit. I believe that there'll be uh, you know something that will will change there. Uh, William, uh, uh, anyone else uh, disagreed in any way, uh, they would be told to go file an appeal. There you go. Uh, all right. So awesome. I put up the bat signal just for you, DNI. I uh, appreciate that. Mr. Wright, if Gensler is allowed to teach at a university, what does it say about the university? Agreed. Now, he was over there teaching about, you know, he, he references it every single time he speaks that he taught at MIT. Now, the question is, what in the world were they thinking? Uh, that's a good point. At MIT. He taught at MIT. I taught at MIT. Do you know I taught at MIT? Oh, well, when I was teaching at MIT, oh, I taught at MIT. It's a credibility uh, sta uh, standing. Um, and so I think it's very critical that people go back and you look at all of that. I, I, I won't get into all the details. Anyhow, if you guys are brand new here, we had over, we had almost 450 people on this morning on a Saturday rant, which is outstanding. Uh, many of you guys might be brand new here. If you are, if you're brand new to On The Chain, very easy to follow us. You know what you can do? Hit the thumbs up today. Hit the subscribe. Hit the bell notifier. If you don't want to see what it looks like on YouTube, that's what it looks like. You got the red subscribe button. You can click that. If you hit the bell notifier, it sounds cheesy to do it, but you hit that. You hit all. Um, and then that way you get actually get notified when we go live. And we go live six days a week. We stream Sunday through Thursday at 8 p.m. Eastern Standard Time and every Saturday morning at 8 a.m. Eastern Standard Time. All right, so that's it. At tomorrow night, 8 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, Chip and I will be back here, right here in this spot with you guys. Looking forward to another amazing chat tomorrow night. Until then, look forward to seeing you guys on the next one. I am out. Are you down with OTC? Please like, subscribe, and click the bell to be notified when the next video drops.